Now, this event forms part of the VNA's Digital Design Weekend, organized to coincide with the London Design Festival. This conversation is also supported by the AHRC's Digital Transformations Research Fellowship. My name is Luke Robert Mason, and I'm the director of Virtual Futures. And for those of you who are here for the first time, the Virtual Futures Conference first occurred at the University of Warwick in the mid-90s. And to quote its co-founder, it rose at a tipping point in the technologization of first world cultures. Now, whilst it is most often portrayed as a techno-positivist festival accelerationism towards a post-human future, the Glastonbury of cyberculture, as The Guardian put it, its actual aim, hidden behind the brush still, the silicon, the jargon, the designer drugs, and the charismatic profits, was much more sober and much more urgent. What Virtual Futures did, or at least tried to do, was cast a critical eye over the phenomenal changes in how humans and non-humans engage in emerging scientific theory and technological development. This Salon series completes the conference's aim to bury the 20th century and begin work on the 21st. So, let's begin. Eduardo Kack's work explores our relationship with the other in an attempt to create new models of open communication between different species. He has consistently been a pioneer in the field of telepresence and bioart and is renowned for unapologetically experimenting with new and often controversial forms of expression. He's probably best known for his transgenic uh, work, art that employs genetic engineering techniques. These have included a green fluorescent rabbit, a synthetic gene built from a sentence from the book of Genesis, and a genetically engineered plant that contains Eduardo's own DNA. This afternoon, we'll take a deep dive into some of these projects and explore how they seek to challenge the previously dogmatic separations between the living and the non-living, the local and the remote, and the biological and the robotic. So without any further ado, please join me in welcoming Eduardo Kack to the Virtual Futures stage. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. So, Eduardo, your, your background, before all the transgenic art and the digital art and the telepresence, your background is in literature and poetry. And in actual fact, this made up the majority of your early years of your work, but this was around the sort of mid-90s at a time when you were witnessing the rise of things like the personal computer and, and networked uh, devices. I, I just wondered how this, this new world that you saw in the mid-90s changed the way in which you approached things like poetry. I, I started to work in 1980 and created my first digital poem in 1982. And 1982 is worth uh, remembering that's even before the Macintosh computer, right? So that's 84. In 82, um, most of my peers were very much immersed in this new neo-expressionist painting style that dominated the early 80s. So I felt pretty much lonely in my uh, exploration of the digital. But I understood early on that digital was not just another medium that you would add to your repertoire. I understood that digital represented a paradigm shift, um, a, a, the beginning of a new culture. And I felt that poetry had a, a role to play in this new culture, and I wanted to participate actively in the development of this new culture. So for me, everything started in 1982. So let's talk about how you adapted some of your poetic works to this new culture that you're talking about. Some of your work was is hollow poetry and digital poetry. Could you explain what those practices are? Yes, D digital poetry is not simply taking, say, a Shakespearean sonnet and putting on a computer screen. Yeah. That would be of no interest whatsoever. The question is that digital opens up new possibilities for writing and for the creation of new forms of syntax new forms of reading experiences. So for me, that's what uh, working with digital represented, uh, exploring the continuum, the dynamic continuum between word and image, for example. So I, I created uh, different forms for each poem. Uh, with the first one was a loop form, which in the, in, back in, in the day was a, a new uh, mode of engagement with the text. And in the image that we have be behind us, uh, this is actually an interactive work with a VRML, an early form of virtual reality online in 1996. 
And uh, when, you, when you actually accessed it online, it would look like this, it would not move. If you did not interact and navigate, nothing would happen. But as you interacted and you navigated, you started to enter the different uh, aspects of the work, the spiral, you could read around, it. you started to see relationships that you could not if you'd not uh, enter the space. So each digital poem had its own logic and holographic poetry, which I started in 1983, was yet a different type of, um, of, of poetry, one in which I wanted to shift and, and expand the traditional cognitive mode of reading. When you open a book, uh, it's essentially a, a cognitive process. The fact, for example, we have stereoscopic vision. And when you read a conventional book, stereoscopic vision plays no role whatsoever. If you only look with your left eye, and, or if you only look with your right eye, it's the same experience, because you're looking at the flat, uh, flat surface. However, as everything else for us, the, the kinesthetic experience of the world is central to our being in the world or uh, engagement with the world. So I wanted, in a sense, the, the reader to read with the whole body. And in holographic poetry, I started to create what I call discontinuous syntax, where there is no gestalt. You cannot ever see the entire verbal material of the, of the poem in a single take. Um, I started to create concepts like binocular reading, in which what I send to your left eye is completely different. Not stereoscopy, but mind you, not too different of the same thing. But what I send to your left eye is entirely different from what I send to your right eye. So that produces a type of perceptual tension. It's called retinal rivalry. So I have explored different modes of poetry to sum up. And, and these were all, it's to a degree, forms of human communication. You, you weren't just interested in sound, text, or, or moving image. It, you've been interested in spatial, physical, and, and tactile communication. And, and this poetry work led to something else, which was really your, your interspecies communication work. Could you explain what interspecies communication is? Yeah, these, these early uh, works of poetry starting 82 and 83 and moving on from that, they pushed poetry, pushed language beyond what we knew that language could do. They opened up new possibilities for language and progressively introduced language dynamically in, in a continuum that um, goes beyond language, including color, including shape, including appearance and disappearance, including other things that are not traditionally uh, associated with language. And this expansion of language, this moving away from the uh, comfortable element of the verbal economy that uh, human societies operate, led me to open up beyond the human frame of mind. So progressively, I started to think about other modes of communication that were nonverbal, because Communication is around us all the time. Uh, the bacteria that are on the surface of your skin, your skin, my skin, everybody's skin, uh, our cells, everything is communicating continuously. And the phenomena of communication, uh, it, it re in my view, in the early 80s, remain unexplored uh, in, in, in its full potential. So. When we talked about communication, it was a very, very much a human-centered notion of communication. And uh, from a critical perspective, what I understood to be essentially persuasive communication. Good communication was to be able to get something across. Do you know what I mean is a common phrase that we employ. Am I coming across? Are you getting what I'm trying to say? So if I do, then I am a good communicator. Am I coming across? Do you get what I'm trying to say? So. But that's just one among millions of modes of communication that we find in the world, uh, not only among bacteria, but among different, um, different non-human animals, uh, among plants, among the whole living world. Well, let's talk about some of that communication between non-human animals, because one of your first works was uh, an essay concerning human understanding. And, and in this work, you're deliberately exploring interspecies communication. So could you explain what's, what's happening here? Uh, in, uh, essay concerning human understanding, which we know is the title of a famous uh, book by Locke. Um, in, in, this, in this case, the title becomes appropriated uh, poetically and is subverted because uh, humans are essentially absent 
from the equation. I am not going to be a speciesist and discriminate against humans. Humans could come if they wanted, but the work was not conceived for humans. Basically, uh, you had in one location a plant, and in a remote location, literally another city, you had a bird, in this case, a canary. And this, this distance, this drama of distance, was key to the work. Because as I did in holographic poetry, I did not want the viewer, the participant, if there was one, to experience the totality of the, let's say, the, the, the material elements of the work. We, we go through a museum, we go through a gallery, we look at these images around us, and through Gestalt, we seize the totality of the visual content or the material content of a composition. And this gives us the false impression that we have arrived at, at, at the sense of, of totality of understanding. I, by creating the drama of distance, I wanted to make us aware of the fact that that is ultimately an impossibility. You will always negotiate your perception with the conditions in which you find yourself. So in this case, you would either be seeing the plant because you happen to be there or live in that city, or conversely, you would be seeing the bird because you, you live there or you happen to be there. So what happened here was that they were networked. And basically, the bird would sing not because it would make the work more interesting, but being a male canary, it sang because it was looking for a girlfriend. Understandable, right? Understandable. And when, it, when the bird sang, the, the sound would travel through the network and the plant was exposed to the sound through speakers and it would just naturally react to, to the sound that would be coming from the bird and an electrode on the surface of, uh, of the plant would sense its micro voltage fluctuation. I also used a program that monitors alpha brain waves to monitor the fluctuation of the plant, uh, the micro voltage fluctuation and that triggers sounds, and the sounds then travel back to the bird, producing a remote interspecies polyphonic type uh, of uh, non-human communication artwork. So in, in what way does this, this sort of work reveal a degree of speciesism, to, to use the Peter Singer term, in what way does it reveal something intricately unique about non-human communication that's different from, say, human communication or human being? Yeah, human, human communication is uh, essentially, fundamentally persuasive. We're trying to, co continuously, we're trying to express something that produces outcome, that produces, that has a function, that produces behavior. And, um, and in this case, it's nonverbal, it is uh, remote, uh, and it signals basically the emergence of a new model uh, of understanding, and this is also why it's an essay concerning human understanding, because by moving away from the human-centered mode of communication, which remains primarily verbal, we uh, achieve a, a, a sense of the ultimate quality of, of networking that is, that is the substrate of the living world. And when we connect the living world, which used to be over here, and the digital world that used to be over there, we realized that ultimately everything is interconnected. Well, let's talk a little bit more about some of the work that you've done that has attempted to, to connect these digital and these, these physical living uh, worlds. And, and in your work, Teleporting an Unknown State, you essentially turn the internet into a life support system. Yeah, this, this work is from uh, 1994, as, uh, as is uh, essay concerning human understanding. And teleporting an unknown state is a piece in which you walk into the gallery and you find a plant in the dark. And you could be activating this, you could be interacting with the work on your phone, iPad, uh, or on the computer that is in the gallery. But what is exactly that is going on here? The interface, as you can see the participant looking at, basically has a live image of the plant in the center and the name of different cities around it. You click on the name of a city, Paris. You immediately connect with a live webcam. You're transmitting that is looking at the sky 
and it's capturing photons, and you're transmitting those photons to the plant in a remote location. In other words, the plant will not survive if you do not take light from different parts of the world and send to it in a remote gallery. And one of the interesting things about this is that the work remained accessible to the uh, online community 24 seven. The doors of the museum close, but the work remains accessible. And because the work is live, the luminosity of the planet is changing continuously. So we go to sleep, somebody from Tokyo could participate and send light to the plant. I mean, I want to talk a little bit more about this work because it reveals a couple of interesting things about how humans operate when they're perceiving certain artworks. And it feels like this work is almost a reverse of what we expect from mass media. Instead of a, a one-to-many communication, what you've got here is a many-to-one, to the one being the plant in this case. Yes, precisely, because what happens is that I felt that network topology was an element that the artist needed to be aware of because we go on the internet, you use your phone, we are completely alienated from the path that our voices and our data take as, as they leave us. Uh, they, the servers could be switching, there could be uh, microwave connections, satellite connections, you put in your card in an ATM, you have no idea what path your information is taking as it travels around the world and it comes back and says, okay, take money from the machine. So these, these, these data, these connections, these signals that we radiate into the world, we, we are alienated from them. So seeing it, visualizing the network topology and then subverting it and making the network topology visible in a way that serves the work and subverts the logic of mass communication is what I try to do. Mass communication, one speaks and many listen, like on television. Here, many participate and we all converge into that seed that allows the plant to grow. I mean, in this case, what you're doing is, is forcing communication, or I don't want to say forcing, but you're, you're creating communication between humans and non-humans. But in some of your, your later work, in some of your telerobotics work, what you've been trying to do is, is place the human in the eyes of the non-human. So in this piece here, uh, Rara, Rara Avis, uh, you've created an artwork that puts humans in the perspective of a non-human, in this case, a robotic uh, parrot. I mean, how does this sort of work explore that uh, communication between humans and non-humans through networks, digital networks? This, this work is a continuation of the telepresence art uh, that I started in 1986 this one being from 1996. And the viewer uh, walks into the gallery and sees a pedestal outside of a very large aviary. And then the viewer puts on a VR headset and finds herself transported into the body of their telerobotic parrot. And the viewer then understands that she is looking through the eyes of the parrot out into the world and then sees herself standing outside of the cage simultaneously. The work is online, so remote participants are also in the body of the parrot. The parrot coexists with 30 zebra finches that do their business. They fly around, they, they eat, and you know what else they do after that? And, and they coexist in that world where you have the living and the non-living, the robotic and the biological, the local and the remote, creating a new model of a new ecology, which is the world that we actually live in today. So participants would um, intervene from afar. They could even say things, and that could be heard through the mouth of the macaw and say, make a bird fly, and then the bird flies in front of you. You move your head left and right, so does the head of the macaw. So there is this interconnectedness between uh, what is near and what is far, between the living and the non-living. You've used two words there, one telepresence, but more importantly, telerobotics. I mean, what is the difference between those two things? Uh, tele telerobotics is a term that is commonly used uh, more uh, in an industrial sense, uh, where the desire is to um, perform a specific function. So there is this, uh, this fundamentally uh, industrial applied functionality and it can also be used for simulation. 
I am not interested in simulation. I am interested in stimulation of new modalities of presence, inventing new modalities of presence. Because presence is essential. Here we are, present, together. And the fact that we are here together means something, carries value. But it's an underrated mode of communication. We know, for example, that if you're alone at home and then your dog comes around and sits on your lap, you understand the value of that co presence, right? You're with a friend as opposed to being by yourself. You understand the value, even if you're not talking, just of being together. So presence is a mode of communication and is a mode of communication that is undervalued, underanalyzed. So inventing new modalities of presence, I thought, back in the 80s and through the 90s, could open up new modes of art making. I mean, you really were inventing this hardware, I, th I think it's important to know that this was 1996. A lot of this stuff you had to build or had to create yourself. I, I wonder how you feel. I mean, you've seen some of the works downstairs, but how accessible the hardware and the robotics and the sort of VR headsets are now, how it really changes approaches to work such as this. I mean, this was cutting edge in 1996. I, right, so I, I started in 1986 and uh, you know there was no industry to buy robotic parts like we have today. Today you can buy a leg, you can buy basically everything and assemble a robot in, in a few minutes. But uh, in 86, uh, 89, my, my second telepresence robot is currently on view at the ZKM. And I have the fondest memories of buying aluminum plates and carrying them in the bus and uh, cutting holes and you know building from ground up because the work was driven by a vision, not by what was or was not available. So if it wasn't available, then I would make it exist so that I could make the work. It is as if if you wanted to paint, but painting didn't exist, then you have an image of what the painting is like, and then you have to make a canvas, you make the brush, and you make the paint, and then you paint. Do you think there's been a reversal of that in the digital artwork we see today? The accessibility of commercialized VR headsets has made it so easy that folks and digital artists usually start with the uh, tools that they can get their hands on and then build the artwork from that. Do you think you've seen that reversal? Or do you think it's still a case of, of making a new or trying to hack and break some of these, these technologies? I never subscribe to the postmodern notion that we live in an era in which everything has been done and all we do is recycle the past. I, I don't believe in that. I think we will continuously invent the future. So if there is a first step to take with what is at hand, so be it. But we continue to forge ahead and invent a new future. Well, let's talk about some of the other ways that you've invented the future because you are one of the early pioneers of this thing called bioart and one of your first bioartistic interventions was called uh, time capsule. Now, this really was a departure from some of the digital works that you'd been doing, and, and it was looking more at these, these very visceral works that included the human body. I, I just wonder, what was the reason for this transition in 97? Yeah, in, you know, I had been, in 1997, I had been working online since uh, 1985, so, we are you know, talking about, and, and with the first digital work in, that I made in, in 82, so we're talking about a, a significant amount of time working online, and I felt in 97 that there was a certain amount of discourse that was disproportional to the nature of networking. I felt that there was a sort of a digital mannerism uh, taking place in which uh, there was excessive discourse, uh, for example, talking about the, the notion of uploading your consciousness to the internet, which I never uh, believed. Uh, I always have very much a phenomenological body-centric uh, understanding of, of phenomena. And I felt that it was necessary to counter this, uh, this exaggerated, exaggerated uh, belief in this disembodiment through the internet and, and operate a visceral turn, uh, but not going back to body art of the 60s and 70s, opening up something new, something that had to do with the new condition of the 21st century that was uh, on the horizon. So in 1997, 
I created Time Capsule, which is an artwork in which I implanted a digital microchip live on TV and live on the internet. And I had three insertions in this uh, television broadcast. The first was to set up and explain to the audience what was happening. The second, as you see here, was the moment of the implant, which I did. This you cannot see because uh, the photographer was uh, close to the wall. But behind me, there are seven sepia tone photographs that evoke, as they often do, um, the past, the recent past. So I was contrasting the notion of digital memory with analog memory. That was one key aspect of it. But uh, the third insertion in the broadcast was allowing remote participants to enter the body and read the content of the chip, which they did. I want to talk a little bit more about this work because what it feels like it's trying to do is understand how new technologies have culturally mutated the human body. And I just wonder if you could talk to that. And in which way, in what way, sorry, does time capsule really focus on the way in which we perceive the body in an age of technology? We have um, relied extensively on, on visibility. Uh, we have relied extensively on what we can see. A lot of our concepts and, and our behavior have to do with visibility. But I am convinced that we need to understand that what is not visible is not necessarily conceptual. Your heart, for example, is not visible to me, but I do not doubt for a second that you have one and it's beating, right? So we have to, we have to develop other modes of cognitive engagement that engage, that, that deal with what remains non-visible uh, beyond, beyond this, this envelope of, um, of traditional uh, cognitive um, recognition. So the presence of the microchip creates a situation that puts the body in direct relationship with the networked environment. And the interesting, one interesting aspect of this is the fact that the chip itself is not visible. Well, it is when I go through the airport, right? So you can see, <laughs> they, they always stop me because there is a little square on my leg. Um, and so yes, the chip is inside the body still. And, and the fact that it's not visible, but precisely its power might come from that very fact. So how do you deal with that? How do you deal with something that you cannot recognize visually, which is our primary mode of communication? We have stereoscopic vision, say for example, unlike a rabbit that has uh, the eyes producing almost 180 degree, or uh, certain kinds of birds, fish, for example, right? Not every creature has stereoscopic vision. So we focus just a few inches in front of our eyes. Uh, we objectify, we isolate. This is what stereoscopic vision does to, for us. This leads to concepts, this leads to a worldview. So it's really important to, to understand that. But when you don't necessarily operate with that, and you have something inside the body that is linking you, to the entire data field of the planet. Uh, what does this mean? So this is one of the questions that the work wanted to ask. So I wanna move from, uh, from your work that you created for non-humans to the work that you've done creating the non-humans themselves. And these are your transgenic art pieces. And I wanna start with the first one here, which is Genesis in 1999, which is a transgenic artwork, but before we talk about Genesis, could you actually explain what transgenic art is? Uh, transgenic or transgenics was uh, a term that was widely employed in, in, um, in the 90s to describe the presence of genetic, genetic material from one species into another. And by saying that, we might as well be saying human because we have DNA from uh, bacteria and viruses in our genome. So, uh, which is something that we only learned recently through the Human Genome Project. So in the beginning of this whole conversation, uh, we described, it was the general tendency to describe transgenics as being the other. I'm not transgenic, I'm human. Transgenic is always the other. But once we understood through the Human Genome Project that we have always been transgenic, we just didn't know it, See, again, it's the, the visible and the invisible. 
then it, it really operated a cognitive shift. And it places us humans in a wider spectrum of the community of life. And these bio artworks, the ultimate, in a sense, uh, aspect that they, they bring it for, uh, forth is, is the understanding of, of our presence in a larger community of life. Genesis operated with bacteria. So the fundamental uh, gesture in Genesis was the translation of a passage from the book of Genesis, from the Bible, into Morse code. I created a code that allowed me to translate the Morse code into a DNA sequence, and then I had the DNA sequence actually synthesized. I introduced the synthesized DNA sequence into the bacteria together with another sequence that allowed the bacteria to glow green and allowed participants from home or in the gallery to activate through telepresence a UV light box causing mutation in the bacteria. In other words, you are at home in London and you're pushing a button and you are changing the word of God in the body of the bacteria in Tokyo live right now. One little button, same that you used to buy a book on Amazon or send an email to a friend, you are changing the word of God in the body of the bacteria. So after the exhibition, I brought the bacteria back to the lab and resequenced so that I could see how it had been transformed. And then I produced a whole series of works on granite paper and other materials uh, that uh, explore different aspects of this, one of which is actually also on view at ZKM right now in an exhibition called Open Codes. So, I mean, how does work such as this really reveal the distinction between the living and the non-living? In other words, how are you finding with, with works such as this, the boundary between information communication and biology almost disappearing? Right, so consider, consider this. Let's revisit what I, what I just said because it, it's a key uh, aspect of, of this conversation. You have in front of you a text. It happens to be not any text, a sequence from the Bible, a moment in which God gives man total control over all life forms. And you, what I did was I sent this to a lab via the internet, right? And then two weeks later, via email, and then two weeks later, I get a vial with the synthetic DNA, the little white powder, which back in 99, you could send uh, white powder in the mail. <laughs> Today is a little more complicated. So you, you produce this, this uh, material, and then it goes into the body of the living. You have text on your screen, and now is in the body of the living. Participants, locally or online, cause mutation, they change the text, and now you read this back and you put it back where it all started on the internet, which you can see again on your computer screen. So you realize that what we're talking about is input, processing, and output. What you do all the time when you use your phone, when you use your computer, input, processing, output. What you do with digital systems, you're doing here not only with a living system, but in a way that the distinction between the digital and the biological are not operational. Those pillars, the fundamental pillars that have brought us to this point where the living is over here, the non-living is over there. The biological is over here, the digital is over there. The network is over here, ecology is over there. All of these works, they have been trying to poetically, imaginatively, in, in a lyrical way, subjective, personal way, but they have been trying to show that that philosophical, economic, political concept is false. Everything is interconnected. And, and moving into the 21st century, as Genesis tried to signal back in 1999, we're really talking about a spectrum. Digital and biological now form a spectrum. And part of that spectrum is the work that you're probably 
most known for, which is the GFP bunny. In other words, the green fluorescent protein bunny, aka Alba. Now, could you tell us the scientific process behind creating a green fluorescent bunny rabbit? Well, basically, you take the, the genetic material of interest, in this case, GFP, the green fluorescent protein, which I had used also in Genesis. So Genesis and GFP and the eighth day, all three form my creation trilogy. In all three works, I use the GFP gene as a marker. Uh, and this, this property that the GFP gene uh, enables or endows the organism with, which is to glow green under blue light, um, is a signature element of the three works. In this particular case, I was interested in, in the ubiquitous expression. So basically, you need to have a promoter, which is a sequence that uh, guarantees that the, in, the sequence that you're interested in, which is GFP, will be ubiquitous. So a, prom, a ubiquitous promoter will make sure that that sequence you're interested in will go everywhere in the organism. So basically, working with a microscope, you introduce the sequence of interest in the uh, male reproductive cell inside a zygote. So naturally, after you, you do that, the two cells, the male and the female, will merge, and then copies will be uh, distributed throughout the whole organism. And you know, when the Nobel Prize was announced for GFP in 2008, uh, at that point, GFP had become really a ubiquitous tool around the world. But, uh, but this is 2000, so that's eight years before they received the Nobel Prize for it. And um, that was basically the process, and then, uh, and then you have a normal, regular birth. I mean, you make it sound almost frighteningly simple, but there were some really visceral reactions to this sort of work, both from religious groups, animal rights activists. I mean, what were some of the reactions to this green fluorescent bunny? Well, one of the interesting things about it is, is that um, she was cast as, initially, not anymore, <laughs> but she was cast as, as a monster. And when uh, slowly it became clear that we all are transgenic ourselves, uh, this, this ascription of alterity to Alba became much more difficult. If we have ourselves DNA from other species, why would Alba be any more monstrous than, than ourselves? One thing that we forget, and in a certain, to a certain degree, perhaps fortunately, is what was happening in the year 2000. We had the Y2K scare. We thought that the world would end in 2000. Satellites would fall from sky. Hospitals wouldn't have energy. That computers would shut down. And then we had the med cow disease. We had blood contamination. We had also in France, where the work was made, we had wine contamination, which is probably even more critical than blood yeah. contamination. And um, so it was, it was a time in which the transition into the new millennium uh, was very scary for a lot of people. And seeing Alba on the front page of newspapers worldwide uh, probably made her a symbol of this new era. I mean, I agree we're, we're all to a degree transgenic, but we don't all glow green, at least uh, the folks I know don't. And I, I wonder, the work that you're doing, are you perceived as having some sort of Frankenstein fetish? No, I may have a, an Einstein fetish, maybe a Gertrudstein fetish, but certainly not a Frankenstein fetish. I, I think the audience had a Frankenstein fetish uh, back at the time, but we do glow. Uh, indulge me for a second here. Take your right hand and move it very close to your left arm, like uh, a fraction, uh, almost touching, almost touching. Do you feel the warmth? Yeah. That's infrared. And many species can see that. Certain types of snakes, certain types of beetles can see infrared. So we do glow. Biophotonics is, a, is part of the natural world. Uh, we just cannot see it, you see, all the judgment that we bring to the world based on vision. This is exactly what I'm trying to talk about with Time Capsule. Well, you try to flip that funnel. So in this case, Alba was the other, but in your next work, The Eighth Day, really what you were trying to do was reposition the human as 
the other, insofar as the human wasn't the, the entity within this environment that glowed luminescent. Right, so we're talking about my creation trilogy with Genesis, GFP Bunny, and the eighth day, the eighth day being the third and last one. With Genesis, I worked with a single cell organism, right, bacteria. With GFP Bunny, I worked with a mammal, so it's a complex multicellular organism. And then I brought it all together in the eighth day where you have a community of the living, except that every single organism in the eighth day glows green. We have mice that glow green. We have fish that glow green. We have plants that glow green. Plants are green, but in the dark, they, you can't barely see, but they glow green, so you see them glow green. And I had also what I call a bio-robot in the center of the work. And this bio-robot was partially controlled by humans, partially controlled by amoeba that did glow green as well. So the amoeba controlled the legs of the robot and humans controlled the eye, once again, either from the gallery, there was a computer in the gallery, or from home. So the observable global behavior of the biobot was the result of there being amoeba controlling it and humans also controlling it. For example, if the amoeba would, I'm not saying the amoeba deliberately think, oh, let's move the leg this way, that's not what I'm saying, but in, in their world, they make decisions about their conditions, about food, about reproduction, they make decisions which were tracked. And if more activity was going this way, that leg would be moved. More activity was happening this way, this leg would move. So as they just did their business and the, the legs would move accordingly, so you're trying to look at something over here and then the leg moves, then your eye goes down a little bit. So, but that could make a mouse be perhaps frightened and then run towards a fish. And so this, this chain reaction that happens uh, that we're very familiar with in our own world also happened in that world. But the fact was that Glowing infrared made us different relative to that world. And this reversal of point of view, which I had explored in my telepresence before as well, was something that I was trying to communicate and get across. That, but also the fact that we're dealing with the synthesis of a new world of the living. And this is an entire community of creatures that were made, not found. Well, you went one step further in 2003 to 2008 because you created a new species. You created a plant animal, a plant animal uh, in the work Natural History of the Enigma. This is a brand new life form, but for the audience, could you explain exactly how this was created? So this, this work, uh, Natural History of the Enigma, uh, was uh, a piece that I worked on for six years. And my, my objective was to create a plantimol, uh, a plant that has animal characteristics. In this particular case, what I wanted to do is, from my red veins, from my blood, take a sample, extract a piece of DNA, and move that to the red veins of the flower. Not just a passage from one red vein to another, but to have this particular DNA sequence uh, be functional in the plant. In other words, to produce my human protein that that particular sequence produces in my body to produce it in the body of the plant. We humans have separated from plants in the history of evolution uh, quite close to the beginning. So we're talking about approximately four billion years of evolution of life on this planet, and we separated from plants early on. Except that here, we go back to this, we converge back to this condition of being close to plants, because I feel that, it, once again, uh, all the entire community of life is interconnected. Well, this was a petunia, and it had a particular name because of the process that you Right, so we, it was a petunia over there and Eduardo over there, and now they, in a sense, became united, so Edunia is the name of the plant. And is Edunia still in existence? Yeah, because I made a series of works which are um, 
seed packs, and uh, the seed packs come naturally with the seeds, and they get planted and they get exhibited. Uh, Edunia has been shown in Austria, has been shown in Spain, has been shown in Poland, has been shown in a lot of different places. So you're living, propagating, living, yeah, you're living. propagating galleries yes, yeah. all over. I mean, the question I have to ask is, what has bioart done? I mean, in terms of the way in which we think about these new life forms, these new forms of artificial life that are being created. I mean, we've always had this cultural imaginary of the chimera or the, or the mythic uh, animals and beasts, which are a collection of different beasts uh, pulled together. How is bioart actually realizing, and actualizing some of those uh, previous mythoses and legends and fantasies? We now go from myth to medium. We go from legend to life. We are able to imagine a creature and then work to bring this creature into the world is a, is a profound shift. Uh, we're no longer operating with metaphor, allegory, representation. We are enabled to, we're able to enact our imagination and bring these imaginary creatures into the world is, is a profound paradigm shift. I mean, I wonder, is, is transgenics and transgenic work important for the survival of life? I mean, as species die, what artists such as yourself are doing is actually creating new species. Yeah, and you know, the, the, point, the point is not, art is not, uh, is, is not competing with realms of, of economy, realms of science, art is a space in which imagination is free, and uh, the artist certainly has a, a sense of social responsibility, but art is not here to replace conservation. Art is not here to purely and simply counter the effect of species destruction. Of course, we have to avoid extinction. We have to do a, a much better job in taking care of the creatures that do exist at this point uh, on the planet. But in addition to that, in addition to that, uh, bio art brings new uh, life forms into the world, expands what uh, our understanding of life is. And it does so at once with a sense of poetics and responsibility. Well, Eduardo, it seems like you're not just settled on dealing with the life forms on this world. You, you've gone almost from the the microscope to the telescope, because your new work is focused on space, and specifically uh, works that are found and created in outer space. Could you explain what's going on here? I was an artist in residence for 10 years at the French Space Agency, and I worked with the French astronaut Thomas Pesquet, and uh, I, I was in, in residence at l'Observatoire de l'Espace, which is the cultural lab of the French Space Agency. And through uh, l'Observatoire de l'Espace, I was able to produce this work in space. So what I'm talking about is not making something on Earth and bringing it to space. That is not what I'm talking about. I am talking about, for the first time in history, making an artwork outside of the planet Earth. So the astronaut brought nothing uh, with him, and in space, he used materials that were already available and followed the protocol that we, we trained to produce this work. The work is at the same time verbal and visual, depending on the position in space. The work is conceived for zero gravity. In zero gravity, there is no up and down, no left or right, no front or back, and the work has no up and down, no left or right, no front or back. It's conceived explicitly to enable a verbal reading and a visual reading depending on the position. Because once again, the viewer, the participant, is also kinesthetically floating in zero gravity and its position is always relative to the work as, as this experience is negotiated. I mean, in what way does is space and zero G offer new poetic opportunities to create works such as this? I believe that we are at the point in, in history that is very similar to what I saw in the early 80s. Uh, space is not just another medium that one might be able to add, even if it takes 10 years, um, to, uh, to one's repertoire. I think we're beginning to see a cultural shift in the sense that 
our entire history of art practice, for example, just to take one element of, of uh, our cultural repertoire, the entire history of art has been subjugated by gravity. From the very first cave painting ever made to something that was made here by somebody this morning, all of it, you think of the effect of, think Pollock, for example, which is probably the easiest uh, example one can give. You try, in zero gravity, you try to throw paint down and the paint would just float. You'll never be able to make that painting in, in, in the manner that we know Pollock uh, executed. So gravity has conditioned the form, the action of every material, every form, everything uh, in the entire history of art. Not only the history of art, the history of writing as well, because writing is gravitropic. We take English, for example. We move from left to right and we go down. Take uh, systems like Arabic and, and Hebrew, you go right to left and you go down. Take ideographic systems as Chinese or Japanese, you, you have these vertical modes of, of writing and they go down. So we don't have social, of course you can take type and pretend that it's going up, but that's not the point. The point is that our social uh, verbal modes of inscription they mimic the logic of gra gravity. They are gravitropic, they always go down. So what could art be, what could poetry be if those constraints are no longer in existence? So th those are some of the questions that the work seeks to explore. I mean, to, to a degree, we also have to ask, what would a body be? If a body is born in zero G, how would it be formed? I, I wonder, the, the genealogy of all your work, whether it always, it, it, this, new interest in space is coming back to a realization that maybe it won't be humans that colonize the stars, it might actually be non-human entities. In other words, we already have tele-robotics that exist outside on the stars. We have two current landers in on Mars, and it's the way human beings can port their consciousness, be tele-present on other planets, do you think that it's actually not going to be human beings that explore the stars, but non-human entities that will carry with it our consciousness? We can transport the human brain at the speed of light in the form of information through the stars and telepresence, but the human body is much more difficult. So consider this, right? What, what you would call something that is born outside of the Earth? Alien. So this is an alien work of art. We are already taking steps towards this alien culture. When we sent in 97 uh, the first lander to Mars, there was no need to look for other forms of life. We were already there. Yeah. So, and this not to mention the possibility that some bacteria went along for the ride because we know that uh, bacteria are very resilient organisms. Bacteria live in nuclear reactors. Bacteria live inside rocks. Bacteria survive extreme pressure. So bacteria can adapt to the most extreme conditions. These organisms are called extremophiles, organisms that thrive, not just survive, they thrive in what you would consider inhospitable conditions. So as much as one tries to make these landers sterile, if bacteria can survive in nuclear reactors, what kind of sterilization can you apply to something like that? So, so not, not to speculate on that, I think we have seen uh, direct evidence of life on Mars, which is our own. So do you think NASA is accidentally doing bio-art projects in space by populating bacteria through a form of panspermia on Mars? No, I, I, don't, I don't think that. Um, but we do know, for example, that the water bear, popular name for a small organism, um, has survived conditions of outer space. So we have taken a very small animal, put it out there outside of the Earth, and it survived, and we brought it back, and it reproduced, and it lived a normal life. So we have demonstrated that an animal, a, a, a earthbound animal, has survived space conditions, that much we know. And we also know that we are developing a space culture because we're beginning to make art outside of the planet Earth. 
we are at the, at, the, at the beginning of a new era in which space will no longer be the dream of science fiction. Uh, we know that soon enough we're going to have suborbital flights. The space station, for example, the space station that we have now, it's not going to be there forever. It's between 10 and 15 years it will be brought down. A new one will be built. And there's talk now about the possibility uh, that one of the modules will be a hotel. So I'm sure that if we got a chance to go one day, in, initially, of course, it's going to be very expensive, but as with airplane flight as well, you know, it, it will progressively go down. Once we look at the Earth from space, it's going to be magical. It's going to be amazing. And then the next day you look again, it's still going to be amazing. And the third day is going to be cool. And then the fourth day is like, well, so what's for lunch? <laughs> and, he, and then you're going to have just an ordinary earthbound lunch? No, you want something that is created in space, a nouvelle cuisine, right? A new, a new type of cuisine has to emerge in zero gravity, right? And, uh, and then you look again at the Earth, wow, amazing. But then what do we do tonight? So a new form of theater has to emerge. A, a new space culture has to emerge once we begin to inhabit zero gravity conditions on a regular basis. So do we have someone from the VNA uh, to run a mic for me? Because I, I think we have time for about two questions. So any burning questions in the audience? Did you say bunny questions? Bunny questions or burning questions, but there's always bunny questions. Wow, we answered everything? This question just here. Sorry, making you work. She's, uh, you're not going to get through there. What? Just here. See, if it was in zero gravity, you could do just this. Throw it. Just release the microphone and you grab it. Yeah, I can hear you. Um, built in space, but um, materials from Earth. So it's not, it's not really an alien piece of art because the materials are from Earth. So, so it's just a piece of art that happens to be built in space, but it's still not alien. And now there, there's about the, this fantastic scenario of having the hotel and all this. So let's imagine that um, we procreate out of, out of Earth and into the space, we will not be considered any more earthly, earthly um, humans. We will become aliens that will, will change the concepts of um, relationship between the body, of how we relate on Earth and space. Because without the body, we cannot have that communication that you were, ha you were talking in the beginning. Um, even if we have elements that allows us to communicate, like in this case with this microphone, so you can hear me, you, you, I need my body, you need a body so you can hear me, so I can talk and express this. So this whole um, project of bringing this bio art is more of um, seeing the body as a canvas for experimentation independently of where we are at, either here on Earth or in space. I mean, I don't know if my idea is coming clearly because my brain right now has so much information. But <laughs> so I don't know if you understand. Um, so Eduardo, I wonder if the question is almost, are we going to find that we're not just trans species, but we're also aliens? Well, let, let, me, let me take, a, take this question of the alien to um, another level. So suppose that you get a chance to go to Mars and you had a baby on Mars. Would that baby be Martian? I don't think so, because in order to be considered to be Martian, it would have to have all the organisms. It's like I'm Colombian and I'm in England. 
I'm not English. I'm, even if I live here forever, I'm always going to be Colombian. But what about you know what your I mean? child? If your child is born and raised in it's London? It's going to be a child of an immigrant. It's, it's this, that's the thing. <laughs> you know, it's, no, it's never going to be considered English. It's, it's going to be like, yeah, you were born in England, but you're not English. You know, your mother is Colombian. Your father is from China. I don't know, whatever. You're not English, you're not. So that would be the same thing, I'm, in my point of view. We can go and colonize everything else. Like the Spaniards came to Colombia and they colonized South America, I, but they're I not think, Colombians. I don't think that is true because if a child is born in Mars, that child would experience conditions that are profoundly different from Earth. Uh, already questions of gravity would be different. The effect of gravity on the body and the mind of the child would be different. Uh, what the child would experience would be dramatically different from its uh, original context, and its identity would be different. So I, it's in that sense that I say that this work is alien. It's not so much a question of the materials, but the fact that it was conceived for conditions that are not found on Earth, and it was effectively brought into existence in these conditions. So it's, it, it's not here, it's up there. So it was conceived for those conditions, it was made there, and it is there. Therefore, it's not of this earth. And what do you call what is not of this earth? Alien. But we can continue afterwards. Time for one more question. Just here. If I can hold pass, one of these plans, pass the mic, we're recording. And I've known you. Well, technically, uh, if you can clone a mammal, you can clone another mammal. Yes, technically speaking, you could. Uh, you put in all the good stuff so that we can really clone you from beginning to end. I'm personally not interested in doing that because if I clone myself, I would be the father of this individual. And I am not seeking to have additional children at this point. <laughs> So I am not personally interested in that. But technically speaking, if you can clone one mammal... Uh, I could, could use the plant, take out your DNA that you put in, and clone you from it? No, no, it's just a small fragment. It's, oh, no. It's, 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 you know, the, the goal is to produce that protein as a symbolic gesture. For, you know, it's functional, but its primary function is to operate uh, symbolically. But it's a pity because it would have been legal because you published it. So it is now public domain, I assume. <laughs> oh, it's released, so... Keep your seeds away we, from we that wait guy. For the That's next, what I'm saying. <laughs> we wait for the next plant that is a little bit more comprehensive. Bring a pair of scissors and you can cut the leaf from the, from the plant. Thanks. <laughs> That's why you shave your hair and why don't you worried about people cloning you. So the last question I have is, is how do we fundamentally create artwork outside the human perceptual range? Or more specifically, what would art actually be like if we recognize uh, the aesthetic dimension of the non-human, if we really embrace the aesthetic dimension of these things we're calling the non-human? Well, so th there are several dimensions to, to this issue. One is to begin by recognizing aesthetics in the non-human, to, to understand that the non-human also engages in behavior that is not necessarily always driven by a Darwinian frame of mind. It's not always competition. It is not always uh, an attempt to beat the opponent to gain an advantage. That's a particular, we now understand the ideological underpinnings of the Darwinian model and even in, during Darwin's time, there are other models that offered alternative perspectives. Like, for example, Kropotkin uh, developed a theory of evolution that was based on cooperation rather than competition. So if we, if we look at the aesthetic experience in the non-human, uh, we begin to understand what the non-human might be doing uh, within its own umwelt, which is the concept of the environment that a given species has predicated on its sensorial apparatus, right? So humans perceive the world in a certain way. We already talked about infrared. Other organisms that see infrared or uh, ultraviolet see the world differently, right? So understanding aesthetic experience in the non-human 
and then also trying to create works for humans, which was what I have done also, trying to create works for humans that open ourselves up to the experience of the non-human. And then a third element is the direct creation of artworks for the non-human. So on that note, you are trans species. You might soon be alien. And no, you can't clone Eduardo. And I want to thank the VNA uh, for having us today and for hosting us this afternoon. This is the third time Virtual Futures has been here at the Digital Design uh, Festival. And if you like what we do, uh, find us online at Virtual Futures pretty much anywhere online or just Google Virtual Futures. And you've heard a lot of potentially scary and interesting, exciting potentialities uh, today. But I want to end with this warning, which is a warning on how, and it's the warning we end every single Virtual Futures with. The future is always virtual. And many things that may seem imminent or inevitable never actually happen. Fortunately, our ability to survive the future is not predicated on our capacity for, or for prediction, although, and on those much more rare occasions, something remarkable does come of staring the future deep in the eyes and challenging everything that it seems to promise. I hope you feel you've done that this afternoon. Please join me in thanking the incredible Eduardo Kack. Thank you.